say hello to everyone. It's been a while since we've been together. The world has changed around us and we don't have the option to get together in the manner that we once did. And I know a number of you have been asking me to try to get back on track to get our Sunday school class back together, to get back into God's Word. And that's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to pick up right where we left off. If you have your Bibles, and if you don't, you have an opportunity to stop this recording and go get it. That's the beauty of this thing. I'd like you to turn to chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 14 this morning. Some of you had asked if we could set this up over Zoom so we could have that dynamic that sort of marked our class in the past, that ability to ask, ask questions, to have input and so forth. And that was kind of exciting to me, but as I looked at this, I know that a number of our people don't have access to that kind of tech. And uh, from what, talking with our people at the church, uh, it was Clint McClure, our uh, children's minister, who said that it might be best to post these things to make the recording Put them through our church website and they'll be available on YouTube and Facebook. Most people have access to one or the others or can get access to that really simply. And so that's what we're going to do. And so it's just going to be a recording. It's going to be one-sided. I do invite you on this. Anything that we talk about here today, anything I cover, you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, email, get to me on Facebook, ask the questions. So we can set up a Zoom if you like, one-on-one -on -one or a small group to discuss afterwards. And I'm more than happy to go over anything that's not clear or anything you'd like to discuss or any input you might have. But, but for now, we're just going to focus on digging into God's Word. Uh, this is going to be difficult for some. I know a number of people have contacted. They're out of state. They haven't been part of the class, and they've been wondering, uh, you know, maybe I could do a special series. But I'd like to continue in Ephesians. And first, I'll tell you this. If, if you want to catch up, I believe that all of the audio recordings for the early part of this class are already on the website. You have an opportunity to get audio for that. If you don't have that opportunity, I'll tell you this. The Word of God has this beauty. If you come to the Word of God and you simply say, I'm going to dig in and find out what God has to say, it's really not going to be a problem wherever you start. So I'm going to tell you that, and I'm going to give you some context today. I'm going to do my best to try to put everybody on the same page, but... Even if you're starting late in this, even if it's not something you've been together with us on Ephesians from the start, I think this will be valuable to you. We're looking at this, and I, I want to set a, a, a context, as I said. The book of Ephesians has a beauty to it in that it is one of the simplest books in the Bible to follow. Paul has laid this out. He's instructing the church on its identity and its conduct. Those are the two themes of this book. Who are you? What does God expect you to do? And the book divides exactly down the middle on those two themes. Chapters 1 through 3, this is who you are. Understand, this description that Paul lays out here is true simply because of what God has done. It has nothing to do with any conduct of your own. It has nothing to do with what you've earned from God. It is not true of just some believers and not of others. This is an identity of every believer. These are the resources of God that you have simply by virtue of salvation. Then starting in chapter 4, the structure goes, having that identity, what should we do? What should our lives look like? And this is how Paul divides his book. Starting in that first chapter, what Paul says is astounding. The things he lays out, he lays out your identity. And I like his beginning point. This is starting in verse 3. It says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Not a bad beginning point, is it? God has said, this is everything I have, and I'm giving it all to you. And understand this. This is true of every believer. There's not an inner group. There's not some inner circle that got special empowerings that others didn't get. There aren't some that have special access to God that some of the rest of us didn't get. This is a reality for every believer by virtue of salvation. This is an act of God. He has taken and has deposited the wealth of heaven into an account that you can draw on. This is his beginning point. He then goes out to this. Having been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ, we have now been put into the plan of God. It says this, In him we were also chosen, being predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with his purpose the purpose of his will, in order that we who were in the first hope of Christ might be for the praise of his glory. That's in verse 11 there. Every Christian has a purpose in life. 
Uh, this is something else that is different. The, the world struggles for meaning. They talk, what is the meaning of life? What am I here for? Well, we're always trying to be self-actualized. We're trying to find out what it is we do and why we do it. We want some meaning. And God immediately established this and said, I have put you into my plan. Every believer is part of the eternal plan of God where all of history is going. You are part of that purpose. You are serving a role in that, gu that guidance and in that plan and in that purpose. Every believer has this capacity. And then he also ends the chapter in an interesting way. He comes down to this. And he says, well, okay, I've deposited all this wealth. I've made you part of the plan. What if you mess up? What if something goes wrong? How do I know that I'll always be part of that? Well, he lays out this, and he talks about his sealing. He says, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked with him with a seal. And what is that seal? The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Do you understand a deposit? Uh, if you put in a security deposit on an apartment or something, you can't get that back if you mess up. It's, it's lost. It's gone. Uh, here's what God is saying. If I don't deliver on what I promised, if I don't give you this, you get to keep the Holy Spirit. Now, do you understand what that, God is basically saying, I would give myself up if I didn't deliver on salvation. It's an impossibility. God would have to deny himself in order to deny you. That's the level of his guarantee for salvation. You have this deposit. Keep it if I fail to perform. And God has to perform on this. And again, all of this is incumbent on me. This is not a two-sided contract. God is not saying, here's my part and you have to... No, he's saying, this is what I'm going to do no matter what else happens. And that's just chapter 1. I mean, that would be enough for most of us. But he goes into chapter 2 and then covers a whole host of other things that are governing for us there. What do we know in chapter 2 about what is true about, from God? And in chapter 2, he starts with a whole new list. And the beginning point is very simple. For once you were dead in your transgressions and sin, and to one in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the rule of this world, but now it's a change. We now have moved from death into life. This is a very basic thing. This is a, a tremendous promise that we were once dead and now we are alive in Christ. That, he says, we have been made citizens of heaven. We have been raised with Christ into the heavenlies and placed beside God. The very throne of Christ, which is beside the throne of God, is where we have moved. We are in this status, into this stature with God, that we have this capacity as citizens of heaven. Understand, a citizen is a, is a person who has rights and privileges incumbent upon them because of their stature. As a citizen of heaven, all of the laws, all the resources, all of the protections that go with that citizenship are now yours. Now, now that's, that's great. If God had done just that, wouldn't that be pretty good? I'm a citizen of heaven. God has placed me in this place. But a citizen can lose rights, can't they? A citizen can commit crimes and be put into prison and lose privileges as just voting and their freedom to move about. They can lose that. We even have the capacity to strip citizenship from someone who has violated, who's become a traitor to our nation. But God has more. He also says he has made you part of the household of God. We move from just a standard of citizenship into family. And family is the ultimate guarantee because no matter what you do, family status does not change. This is the reality we have, that God is always dad. God is always there. God is always available. And that's what leads us into chapter 3. Because now it says we are free to approach God at any time. We can approach him, and I love this word. It says you approach him with confidence. How can you always have confidence? Are there times when you'd rather not let God know what you're doing? And this is the beauty, again, of family. No matter what your action, no matter what you have done in violation of that relationship, God is waiting as dad to put things back together, to restore everything in terms of full function, of full fellowship. God wants this to work. And even in our darkest moment, we can have the confidence that Dad is always available to restore the relationship. So we can approach the throne room of God. He then closes out the chapter with this. And he says that into us, 
Let's try this in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine according to his power that is work within us. What a dramatic reality. He has now said that all of the power of heaven is in deposit in you. And now that you are capable of acting on behalf of God to do and perform the task of your role in the family of God, your role in the plan of God, with the full resources of God always present and there, enabling you to do beyond your greatest imaginings. This is the reality that we've seen. So that's the first three chapters. And I put this, every believer really owes it to themselves to go and read this through periodically. This is who we are, not by any act of our own. This is purely through the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But in chapter 4, now Paul changes focus and says this. Notice chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That phrase literally means to put into balance. To live worthy means to put things into balance. Uh, imagine this, if you will. God has taken a scale, and on one side of the scale, he has piled all of the resources, all of the power of heaven, all of the gifts that he has given his believers, and that scale has pegged itself down on that one side. And here's what Paul says now. This is what God has done. All of the scale is piled with this, the riches of God. Now bring that scale back into balance by doing this, by living a life worthy of your calling. Let's be very clear here. Paul is not saying that it, now we have a debt that has to be paid because God has done all this in order to keep our salvation. We owe God something. What God is saying here, what Paul is laying out for us is simply this. Because God has done this, gratitude demands of us a response. A response that is worthy, a life that is consistent with what God has made us to be. God has declared us to be this, our conduct should therefore be consistent with that declaration, unchanging, always part of this. And this is what he now tries to put out before us, to put things into balance. And what does that look like? This is what the next three chapters are really dedicated to. Knowing this is what God wants, knowing that we have all these resources, what does a life consistent with that identity look like? And Paul then does three chapters describing in depth what it looks like to be a child of God, what it looks like to live a life consistent with that identity. And he begins with this. Be completely humble. He describes this as it said, to walk worthy. A walk in humility is the first beginning point. And he describes what that means. You know, a person that can put their ego aside, a person that can set aside their arrogance and their self-centeredness, it says that we'll be able to do something. We'll be gentle and patient. When it isn't about you, you can be patient. When it isn't about your stature, your arrogance, suddenly you can be gentle and patient. And that's the beginning point. And then he says this, making verse 3, making every effort to keep the unity making every effort to keep the unity. It is a unity walk. This world is always talking about its desire for unity, its wish that somehow or other we're all just going to get along. And we have some weird definitions of unity. Uh, we are trying to tell ourselves that unity is really uh, everybody being different, and that somehow makes us united. Uh, yes, we're all different, but unity is based on something held in common. And Paul defines that one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one spirit. He says this, we strive for a unity based in one body of truth established by one God and, is, and gained for us by one sacrifice and one Savior. Our unity is based on something we hold in common. And this unity supersedes every division the world wants to put out. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with ethnicity or language or any other kind of differences in terms of socioeconomic. All of that is swept aside. Because God puts us into unity. But notice how it says, making every effort to keep it. Understand, God made us unified. The only thing we can do is mess it up or keep it. We can't create it. God has already created it. It is now our responsibility to somehow keep it, to act on it. And that's the next aspect of our walk. 
We have those things and we have that capacity. We are then told to walk in love. It's a love walk. We are told that we're supposed to be marked by and seen by a love, a caring. And understand what God talks about when he talks about love. Love is never anything about how you feel. People always talk about that, you know, love in all of our romance novels and every place else we look. Love is supposedly all about how we feel about things. God's action in love is what does love choose to do? Love in Scripture has always been an action verb. It is an action thing. What do you choose? In spite of how you may feel in the moment, how, no matter how, what's going through your mind, no matter what emotional low or high you have in terms of uh, feeling good or feeling bad, what do you choose to do? And our walk must be one that, based on what we know to be true, what do we choose to do? What action do we choose to take? We are putting these things into balance. Paul describes it this way. We are to be in 5.1 imitators of God. Imitators. Uh, those of you who have been in the class, remember we found that word mimetai in the Greek. Mimic. It's from where we get mimic. And if you remember the aspect of mimic, a mimic isn't just someone who gives a general impression. What they do is they strive to be exact in their representation of the person they're imitating. They try to get the words down perfect. They try to get the actions down perfectly. They try to get every aspect and every nuance to look as exactly like and sound exactly like that person as possible. That is the Christian goal. That is what we're tr trying to transform ourselves into. That's what 2 Corinthians 3.18, being transformed into his likeness. It's the process of trying to make that happen. So we walk in these ways. We walk in humility, we unity. We're also told it's supposed to be a different walk in chapter 4. A different walk. Chapter 4, verse 17, it comes out and says, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Because we know what is true, because we have come to understand the truth of God, there should be a difference in how we act and how we live. Truth is supposed to impact life. Truth is not some sterile, arbitrary, philosophical thing in Scripture. Truth is meant to change living. And we now understand we are no longer ignorant and we are to live differently. We are to walk differently. There should be a pattern of us that is unmistakable in our lives that people cannot miss. Now that's our context. I hope we brought everybody kind of onto the same page now. The next thing Paul wants to start talking about in chapter 5, and beginning in verse 8, he says this walk, this unity walk, this walk in love, this humble walk, this different walk, also needs to be a walk of light. Let me read this for you. Chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. For the fruit of light that consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. And this is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So our walk is supposed to be a walk of light. Now that's going to be something we need to define fairly clearly. And let me put this out. Scripture defines light in two distinct ways. One is intellectual, and the other is moral. These are the two sides of a walk in light. Intellectual and moral. On the one hand, it involves what we know to be true. On the other hand, it then involves how we act in response to that truth. That is a walk in light. If that is light, what does that make darkness? If light is truth and morality, darkness must be lies and immorality. That's the contrast he's drawing here. God is not dealing in shades of gray. He is saying there's a body of what is true and there are actions that are moral in response to that. And he's saying there's a body of lies that are not true and actions that are immoral. No matter how you try to redefine them, no matter how culture wants to try to talk about them or live them, these are the facts of the matter. There's a difference. There is truth, and then there are lies. 
And I know, understand this, God is not interested in helping with your self-image. He is not trying to have you have a high self-esteem. God is dealing in what is true. And what is true is simply this. Some things are right and some things are wrong. There are some things that are true and some things that are lies. Let me try to break this out for you, if you will. And understand, this is where we differ from the world. The world wants to muddy truth, don't they? The world is all about playing games with that. Uh, oh, the truth is always some nebulous thing. I, I love this talk about how we are an enlightened society. We have evolved. If you look at the morality of the world, there's a lot of things it's done. Evolved is not one of them, at least not evolved in a better way. We like to look back at past cultures and talk about how much better we are than they are. We have an ever-changing, muddy idea of truth. One of the more modern concepts is this. There's, there's, this is my truth, and that's your truth. God doesn't care what you consider to be true. God is declaring to you what is. What is true is on his mind, and this is what he goes after. To chase this down a little bit, to give you an idea of this distinction, this is Proverbs 6.23, and it says, For these commands are a lamp, this teaching is a light, and the corrections of discipline are a way of life. Way of life. Truth is a body, a way of life. A standard of what is right. Why don't you check this out? This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And it says, Therefore, since through God's mercy you have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we command ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach our, to ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of his glory of God and the face of Christ. Truth. Light is the knowledge of what is true. That's one aspect. The other aspect in this morality, understand God never delivers something that is not supposed to change what we do. This one comes from Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. It says this, Woe to those that call good evil and evil good, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I don't know if there's a better description of our current world where we're redefining everything in terms of what we want it to be. The world is taking standard terms and institutions and redefining them and trying to say now this is right they're redefining the things of god and making them sin morality is something they're trying to put into a turmoil and god is saying there is one standard and he's saying we have to stand by that this is from romans 13 12 and 13 it says the night is nearly over the day is almost here so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light let us behave decently as in the daytime and not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in the dissension and jealousy. Light then, twofold, to know the truth and to act on the truth. And we have been made light. And this is the contrast between light and dark. And understand here, looking at this chapter again, chapter 5, verse 8. Notice the beginning point there. Notice what he says. For you were once darkness, but now you are light. Notice what he says. He says say you're in the light. I probably should have renamed this. I think I gave the title of this, I walk in the light. This is really a walk as light. Our identity has been changed into light itself. This is who we are. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, that you are the light of the world. It's a statement of fact. In John 5, 1, 5, and 7, it says you are in Christ and therefore no longer in the darkness. I want you to understand this. 
I've had Christians talk to me about this before, make this claim. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian now, and I understand I have this new nature in Christ, but I still have that old nature. And there's still, there's a light and a dark in me. No, there's not. For the believer, there is one new nature. One. And that nature is light. That is your nature. To act on darkness is to violate what you are. You are not this dichotomy, this two-part thing constantly at war with yourself. You are now light. Colossians 1.13 says you were rescued from the kingdom of darkness. And that is all past. Ephesians 5.8 says you, you should therefore walk as children of light. You need to act like that. That is our change. We once were those things. Notice that when it says you were. I don't think this is too hard. I know I've been out of school a lot for a while just like you have. You were darkness. That is a past tense thing. And here it's in, in the emphatic past tense in the Greek. That is so yesterday. That is so over is basically what Paul is saying. That's a done deal. You are now light. Now let me ask you this. Being light, can you do deeds of darkness? Yes. You understand that. We certainly can do deeds of darkness. But understand this now. When you do them, you do them in the light. Before the deeds of darkness were hidden before you, the world does dark deeds and calls it morality. When the Christian does dark deeds, he knows exactly what he's doing. We know exactly what we're doing. There is no longer hiding it from ourselves. We are aware that it is sin. The world can sin and congratulate itself. We can't hide from the fact that that we are acting against what we know to be true. That is the stature of the believer. We live in the light. And this world needs light. They may not want it. In Ephesians 4, looking at verses 18 and 19, Paul says this, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardening of their hearts, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. That's the nature of this world. Sin is in darkness, and it wants more darkness. Understand for the unsaved, sin is not just something they do. Sin is something they are. It's a compulsion that defines them. It is something that they cannot set aside. They are darkness. They are just absolute opposites and cannot exist in the same place. You cannot put dark and light into the same place. Light always dispels it and exposes what is there. Let me just put this out. Paul put a contrast. He said, this is what you were. This is now what you are. In Romans 6, 16, he said this, you are a slave to whoever you serve. There's a simple reality to that, that we have been moved from an old existence and an old slavery into real freedom. I'm always amazed when people tell me this. You know, I, I listen to your faith, Meyer, and I, I hear what you're saying, and I... I understand how you can believe that. That's a good truth for you. There's that personal truth thing again. But they'll say this, I, I just don't want to be that restricted. I, 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 I prefer my freedom, and I don't want that list of rules that marks your faith. Nothing could be further from it. They are a slave to sin, and this is what they don't understand. They are caught in something. It is not a matter of freedom and having to change it for a set of rules. You are serving that. People are serving this as part of their identity. This is what Paul said, I should say, Jesus said when he was talking to the Pharisees. This is John 8, 44. And this is pretty harsh. He said this, You belong to your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. You understand what he's saying there? This is a group of the religious leaders of the time, men who saw themselves as servants of God. And Jesus looks at them and says, You are servants of your father the devil, and you want to carry out his plan. This is part of what you are. 
You are slaves to this. He goes on to, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaks his lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Pretty harsh here. But again, Jesus was not trying to preserve the ego. He was trying to confront them with what's going on in their lives. These men were tied to a service. They thought it was a service to God, but it was not. They served Satan. And this is the reality of those people in the world. They are not just in the darkness. We often look and we see and we think of people, they're, they're fumbling in the darkness. If only they could see the light. The people of this world are not just in the darkness. They are darkness. They are pursuing it. It is an identity of who they are. They are contributing to it all the time. That is what makes it dark. And they are ruled by Satan in that reality. The entirety of this world serves his purposes. And whether people want to accept it or not, if you are not with Christ, you are serving the purposes of Satan in this world. That's the reality of their existence. All the entertainment they create, the philosophies they do, the teaching they put into their classrooms, all of the things that they are, are serving and creating this world which is under his control. And that is the reality of the unsaved. And because of that, it says they are under sentence. Romans 2.5 says they are storing up for themselves wrath. God is going to act against that darkness. And he also says there's a price for it. In Matthew 8.12, he says they will be thrown into darkness, a place of weeping, wailing, and the gnashing of teeth. Here's what God is going to say. If you want the darkness that much, I'll give it to you. I will secure your entire existence for eternity in darkness. But you're not going to like it. And in contrast, he said, but now you are light. You are. Now, what does that look like? This has been the whole point of uh, Paul's second half of the book. If, if this is the walk we're supposed to have, what marks it? Well, let's look at this. For you were once darkness, but now you are light. And then in verse 9, for the fruit of light, and he gives us three things, consist in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. It is marked by these three things, goodness, righteousness, and truth. That first truth, that's an interesting, or I should say goodness, that first one, the aspect of goodness. There are a number of Greek words for goodness that you can find. There's kalos, that's a very common Greek word for good. And this means something free of defects. In Kalos, if I hired a plumber to come in and he fixed the plumbing under my sink, it would be a good job if nothing leaks. If I can get hot and cold water like I'm supposed to, if everything works, that was a good job. A job free of defects. That's good that you did that. There's another Greek word, krestos, which basically means useful. It's good for that task. If you get a lawnmower and it's got a good sharp blade and the engine works and you fire it up, it is good at cutting the grass. If you have the right kind of shovel for a trench, and if you know anything about shovels, there are different types. There's little thin for trenching. There's bigger. If you have the right one, it's good. It's a good shovel for that kind of a job. And that can also be in this. But this is neither of those terms. This is agathune, and it refers to moral excellence. I have pulled this up in my Greek lexicon, and this was the definition. It says this. This is a goodness which finds its fullest and highest expression in that which is willing and sacrificially done for others. Paul used it in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. He says, always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. That is the good that Paul has it. A character of light is that it is seeking the good of others. It is looking for an expression that is sacrificial toward the needs of other people. Righteousness is the second one. This is a person committed to what is right. He has a holy lifestyle. He is marked by a consistency with the standards of God. And then third is truth. Now, this one is all over the place. Every different... Uh, a commentator I looked at, every different Greek lexicon, he had a different word. It's integrity, honesty, reliability, trustworthiness, 
uh, when you when in doubt, I always say choose them all. And that's basically what's going on here. All of these things lie into this. Basically, it says this, what you do and what you say is consistent with what you are. It's an honesty. It's an integrity that doesn't change. And these things sum up a Christian's life. Goodness in relating to others, righteousness in relating to God, and truth, which means you're consistent with your own integrity. And these are what should mark us. These are the characteristics of a life lived in the light. And these are the standards we should know. If you want to test for anything, if you want to know where you stand in your maturity before God, if you, if as a church, let's say you're out there right now and you're in the process of looking for leadership, if you're looking for a new pastor, uh, understand these are the things that should mark. These fruits will grow in the life of a real believer. Now, I'm going to admit that for some believers, that tree may not bear a whole lot of fruit, but there will be some. But the greater the yield, the greater these characteristics, the more you can trust that a person is ready to lead and move forward in the plan of God. Uh, if you're a church and you're looking for a new pastor right now, please be careful to look at these as the characteristics of someone who should lead. How many times I've looked at a church, the guy comes in, he puts out his best sermon, he's eloquent, he's sharp, he's, he's glib, he's exciting, he's funny. What's his character? This is ultimately the issue of where a person should be in life and whether or not they should be the right person to lead in God's house. What's the reality of their character? It's not in our text, but Paul has used this word before, sincere. It's an interesting Greek word. And sincere, the root word, literally means free of wax. That's an interesting, why does it mean free of wax? Well, a pottery maker would take and form the clay, and then they'd fire it. And what would happen if they didn't do everything just right? It could form small cracks or fissures in the pot when they fired it and hardened it. Well, if you went through all the trouble of making this thing, you really just don't want to throw it away and start again. So what did they do? They would go and they would fill these fine cracks with wax and then paint the pot so that you couldn't tell that this was a flawed piece of work. So how did you find out if you should buy this thing or not? Well, the smart buyer would go in and take the pottery and not stay where they've draped all these things in the tents or in the... The, the dark buildings where they have the shops, he would step out into the sun and hold the pot up to the light because it would expose the wax. It would expose the fissures. This is what light does. It exposes what is true. Light tells us the reality of a person if these characteristics mark their lives, no cover-ups, no pretenses. These mark the real Christian life. I often urge Christians to do this. People, we, we struggle at times. Where am I at in my walk for Christ? And I've had people do this. They go, well, you don't need to worry about this. Just go back and remember that day you were saved. Well, guys, I'm going to tell you something. Going to the front of your Bible and finding that you marked down a date that you walked the aisle or a date that you got baptized does not tell you where you stand with God. If you want to know where you really are, look for these things in your life. And as I've said, they may not be as dynamic as they should be right now for you. But no believer can step into the light and not have these characteristics become part of who they are to some degree. If you can do the things of darkness and not be bothered about it, you have every reason to doubt your salvation. But if these fruits are starting to show, if the desire to have them in your life is driving you, that tells you where you stand with God. Always come back to this test. Getting back into our text there, he says this then, For the fruit of the light consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Find out. Wow, well, there you go. There's your, your seeking. How do you find out what pleases the Lord? There's a hard one. Where do you, where do you think you might go? Isn't it, wouldn't it be helpful if God had bothered to write down <laughs> what it is that you should know about him and understand what pleases him? Well, God has meticulously recorded the most complete standard of truth ever laid out before man. You want to know what God wants? Read what he said. God has never hidden anything. God has been plain about it. He's put it right out there. 
I get so tired of people thinking that God is the universal Easter Bunny, stashing his truth around and hoping you can dig it out. It is right here in front of you. Understand it. Take the time to go into it. And then he says this. Verse 11. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Have nothing to do with, or have no fellowship with. If that's literally the term there, it is from the root word koneneo, from which we get fellowship. And here it has the, the preface soon before. It means in depth or very intimate fellowship. And understand what he's saying here. When he says, have no fellowship with the people of darkness, he is not telling Christians to form up monasteries or go into enclaves and to avoid any contact with the people of this world. That's not what's in view here. The idea is simply this, that the most intimate, the deepest fellowship a Christian has should not be with non-Christians. When it comes time for you to seek advice, when you want someone to help you deal with an issue in your marriage, don't go to the non-Christian. When you have issues in your life where you try to conquer some kind of sin, don't seek the advice of a non-Christian. Make your most intimate relationships. Make the input that changes your life for the better come from the people who have a resource that can actually help you. To reach the world, we have to interact with the world. We don't hide from it. We're not supposed to be building a Christian community that never touches this world. But whatever we are, our most intimate fellowship should be formed with the people of God. That's where our friendships need to be. And then he says, but expose it. Now that's a hard one. Who of us wants to be the person that lets people know they're sinning before God? But let's go back to that aspect of light. What happens when you put light in a dark room? You can't help but expose things. That's the reality of it. And we may not like it, but just because of who you are, remember, we are light. I don't know how many times I've had this happen at work. I work at a secular university, and I'll enter into a room, and there's a conversation going on, and the conversation immediately dies. The joke the guy was telling, he suddenly doesn't want to finish. The comments and the language they're using, suddenly they don't want to use it anymore, just because they know who I am and what I believe. It, it's an influence that to have people understand that certain things just don't mesh with a Christian. And that's one aspect of it. The very character of our lives is what exposes things in this world. Uh, why do you think the world doesn't like us around? Just by being there, you contrast, if you're living for God, you contrast truth with their lies. And they hate that. I, I just watched a news conference under our current situation. The president gives updates on this coronavirus on a regular basis. And they had the guy that owns the MyPillow company. And he got up there and said, oh, here's what we're doing. We moved 75% of our production to making masks for medical professionals. And he made a comment. He said, and I would urge Americans to take this time to get close to family and to read their Bibles. Now, you don't have to share his faith, but the guy was just saying, this is what's helping me. The news commentators have been off the charts in anger or how, how disgusting it was for this guy to suggest we should read our Bibles. Just by being who you are, you're going to do this. But let me also put this out to you folks. Some Christians, well, you know, I'm only going to testify and have a testimony through my life conduct, uh, but I don't want to upset anybody. I'm sorry. It is incumbent upon us to point out what is true, and in so doing, we're going to have to point out what is wrong. We're going to have to say things in this culture. We're going to have to confront this culture. When they try to tell us this is what marriage is, we're going to have to say, no, it's not. When they want to come in and say these kind of things or what our children need to learn in school, no, they don't. We need to take a stand, and we need to be vocal about it. And let's be honest, light hurts. When people have lived and been in darkness, when you flip a light on, it's an unpleasant moment for them. But that's what we are here to do. We are the light. Be careful about it. I can't caution you enough in that we are not designed to be joyous about confronting people's sin. And some Christians disturb me. This It's almost like they're excited to find out how bad the world is acting and how someone has done something. Sin is a heart-rending thing. 
when you confront it, our goal is not to just find fault. Our goal is to reveal what is true. This is what we're after in this. We can't afford to be less than light. It says here in verse 12, For a shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. When we confront sin, folks, we need to be careful. We don't need to cover everything. I, I've seen Christians that seem to revel in getting to every little detail of the sin they're upset about. You know, we don't need to know every aspect. We don't need to discuss every little nuance. We don't, it can get almost pornographic sometimes when Christians are talking about the sins of this world. Be careful. Be careful with your language. Shining a light doesn't mean we have to get to a point that we get such graphicness in what goes on. But he mentions this. It, it's, some things just don't need to be mentioned. Some things don't need to be said. I'll put this out. Folks, it, there, there are some things it's okay to be naive about. Christians don't need to understand every nuance of sin to know it's wrong. And sometimes we know too much about sin. At a certain point, at a certain time, some things should be just held back. Verse 14, he sums up. For it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Our best understanding is this last line here, the wake up, O sleeper, was a line from a Christian hymn, like an Easter hymn that later became an invitation hymn at the end of services. An opportunity for someone to rise from darkness, to rise from the sleep, to rise from death, and enter into the light of Christ. And Paul is saying this is the whole point of light. To shed light is not just to expose, is not just to upset, it is not just to hurt. The point of light is to bring people the truth. I would normally at this point say if any of you had any questions or comments, we'd talk about this, but I can't do that because you and I can't talk right now. But as I said, anybody that has questions, anybody that wants to go at this, come up on my Facebook page, uh, send me a text, send me a note, an email, give me a call, and we can talk about these things. Until the next time we get together and go into God's Word, thank you and good day.